OK, so this time we're going to take a look at group theory from this perspective of category theory. Now, I really like this picture here, this sort of map of mathematics that I found on the Internet. You see, we have these different regions here, which are like different areas of mathematics, and they've been playfully depicted as these different kinds of landscapes that are somehow related to each other. And I think this really kind of matches the way I think about maths. I think of it as a sort of landscape or a big shape that we can kind of move around in and explore. And I also really like some of the choices about how these different areas of mathematics have been represented by these different sorts of landscapes. I particularly like the choice to have this sort of moon of category theory here, because indeed, I do think category theory is rather abstract and in some sense sort of distant from other disciplines, but it also has the kind of feature that when you're really into category theory, you can sort of, in some sense, look down on the other areas of mathematics and see them from a very sort of distant vantage point and become aware of more of the kind of connections between rather different disciplines. And I think this is a bit because like one of the things that category theory does is it looks at different kinds of things that are going on in maths and other places, and it just sort of blows the names off things and looks at them as pure kind of data structures in terms of connections and composition. And in this way, we can appreciate the sort of commonalities between these different areas. And we also develop this very sort of general language, which can pretty easily describe in many cases what's going on in these different areas. And so there are lots of places in mathematics where having a sort of category theoretic perspective lets you really quite quickly understand a fair amount of what's going on. And it's surprising that even some areas like um, sort of fractal geometry can be studied quite profitably using category theory. But today, what we're going to do is have a look at group theory. Now, group theory is a very kind of well-studied area of mathematics that lots of people are aware of and lots of thoughts gone into it. And so I think it's going to be really beneficial for us to take a look at what group theory looks like from this kind of category theoretic perspective. Now, I want to say a couple of things about this. One is that I'm not really an expert in group theory at all. Um, so this is just sort of my take on a few ideas from the subject. And secondly, we're going to be looking at this from a pretty kind of abstract category theoretic viewpoint. So I'm not going to be really introducing group theory from a kind of, um, you know, basic sort of axiomatic perspective. I'm rather going to be sort of applying some of the ideas that we've learned about to gain some sort of, um, you know, more um, a sort of fast picture of um, group theory using the tools that we've already been developing. So, OK, that being said, what is a group? Well, for us, we're just going to think of a group initially as being a certain kind of category. OK, so this is the first idea I want to get across. I'll go through the usual kind of definition of a group shortly, but um, honestly, I much prefer to just think of a group as a special kind of category, and it's going to be very useful for us to think of it that way. So let's talk about that. So what do I mean when I say that a group is a certain kind of category? It's a very kind of unusual way to think of it. So firstly, let's remember what a category is. OK, so we have a, a collection of objects and a collection of arrows, and we can compose the arrows. And then there's certain categories that are called groupoids. Now, a groupoid is just a category where every arrow is an isomorphism. And we recall that an isomorphism is just a kind of invertible arrow. 
So when we have an arrow F from an object A to an object B, we say it's an isomorphism exactly when there's this kind of inverse arrow F to the minus one, and it has the feature that if we do F and then we compose it with F to the minus one, we get the identity arrow of A. And going the other way around, if we do F to the minus one and then F and compose those, we get the identity arrow of B. So that's what an isomorphism is. And a groupoid is just a category where all of the arrows are isomorphisms. That's all, okay? Okay, so if that's what a groupoid is, well then what is a group? Well, a group is just a groupoid with one object, okay? So um, this is sort of like the way that we thought about monoids. You might remember that we can think of a monoid as a category which just has one object. And in a similar way, we can think of a group as a category of one object, but it has the feature that each of its arrows are these kind of isomorphisms. Okay. Um, so this is our basic perspective of what a group is. Now, as I say, we will be looking at the other kind of way of thinking about a group shortly, but let's just roll with this way of thinking for a, a moment because it, it gives us kind of instant access to an enormous range of examples. So, okay, here's the idea. This is a sort of way that we can cook up lots and lots of examples of groups. So the idea goes like this. Pick any category C that you like and pick any object A in that category C. And then just consider all of the arrows that go from A to A, which are isomorphisms. We call those kind of arrows automorphisms, right? An automorphism is just an isomorphism from an object to itself. And that's it. That's how we find a group. So we can just make any group by forming this kind of subcategory of C, which just has this one object, A, and the arrows are just these kind of automorphisms of A. And we can compose these kind of arrows in the normal sort of way. And that corresponds to what group theorists call multiplying the elements of the group. So for example, we might have these automorphisms F and G, and then we can consider what happens when we multiply them. So we could, for example, think of G after F. And that's really just a composition of arrows. We could also interpret it to say that, well, you know, let's think of F as a member of this group and G as a member of this group. And now G after F is the kind of multiplication of those two elements of the group. Sometimes um, people might write it as G circ F or even G plus F. So this is the basic idea. And you can hopefully see from this that there are lots and lots of groups that have been there all along when we've been looking at different categories over the course of these videos. Let's actually have a look at a concrete example just to um, clarify things. So let's take our category C to be set. And let's consider an object of set that we'll call two. And this is just gonna be this um, set here, which has two elements, let's call them zero and one. Now, then we want to ask, what are all of the sort of automorphisms of this object here too? Well, there's gonna be two of them, uh, one of them is just this sort of identity arrow of two, which just sends these two things to themselves. Let's call that ID. And then the other automorphism is this one here, which sort of switches these two elements around. Let's call that S for swap. So here's our picture of this group here. Um, just to sort of put this in a more familiar context for people that are used to thinking about groups. 
We'd probably call this identity thing here. We'd probably call this E or something. This just denotes our kind of unit of our group. And so we can say that our group has these two elements here, the unit and this other element that we call S. And we can just record what happens when we multiply these elements by each other. So if we multiply E and E, that means sort of composing these functions. So we do this function E after E, and that's just going to give us E. If we do E after S, that's the same result as doing S after E. And that results in S because E is this sort of unit or identity or neutral element with respect to multiplication. And uh, also in this case, if we do S after S, that gives us our unit. And, and we have this because, you know, if we swap around these two elements here twice, that's as if we did nothing at all. And so we can really record what's going on with this group just with this data here. But I much prefer to think of it in terms of the uh, category. So yes, this I would say is a nice way to think about what groups are. Another good thing about this perspective is that it gives us this notion of kind of morphisms between groups for free. Okay, so a kind of, okay, so as you might have guessed, groups form a category. So there's a category which um, has a great name. It's called group. And the objects in it are the groups and the arrows are these things called group homomorphisms. So basically a group homomorphism is just a function from the elements of one group to the elements of another group, which preserves some of the kind of group structure. But this sort of perspective that we've been using, like automatically tells us what these group homomorphisms are. Okay, so here's the idea. You may recall that there's this thing called cat. Cat is this big category. It has objects as categories and arrows as functors. And um, so cat has lots of objects and uh, some of those objects are going to be groups, right? They're going to be these single object categories that have all of their arrows as automorphisms. And so all we do is we just look at the kind of full subcategory of cat on those groups. So in other words, we just look at cat and then we only look at the objects in cat that are groups. And we only look at the arrows of cat, the functors that go between groups. And that gives us this sort of subcategory of cat. And that is exactly our category of groups. So in other words, if we think of groups as these kind of single object categories, then a group homomorphism is just the same thing as a functor. Okay, so this is one way of thinking about groups. Um, there's another way which is more kind of direct. This usual kind of way of defining a group axiomatically. Um, we're going to do that, but we're going to look at it from a sort of a category theoretic perspective. Okay, so basically the normal way that you define a group is to say, well, we have um, this set of elements and, um, you know, such and such a thing happens with them. They have these properties and um, blah, blah, blah. And that's what a group is. And we're basically going to look at that definition, but the way that we're going to describe the properties is kind of using category theory. So um, basically what I'm saying is that if we have a look at the category set, okay, so let's think about um, this category set. It has objects as sets and arrows as functions. Well, within this category, we can talk about what a group is. OK, because we can describe all of the sort of features of a group by saying, well, you know, we have these functions and they obey these equations. And we can do all that just by drawing some diagrams in the category set. 
So let's have a look at that then. Um, so basically a group consists of a set G and there's going to be a special element of G called the identity. So, um, you know, this is going to be giving us this identity element of G. And there's also this special function M, which takes a pair of elements of G and gives us another element of G. This is called multiplication. So this is going to send a pair of elements X and Y to their multiplication X, Y. Or we'll probably just write it like this usually, x, y. And then we also have this function here, which sends an element x to its inverse, x to the minus one. And so this is the basic sort of data that goes into a group. Um, you know, we have this set g and these three functions here. And then this data has to satisfy uh, a few conditions. Uh, in particular, um, we want it to make these three diagrams commute. This one here, this one here, and this one here. So let's understand what's going on in these diagrams. So what this first one's saying is that if we have elements X, Y, and Z, well, if we multiply Y and Z, so we get Y, Z, and we've also got this X over here. And then we multiply with the X. So now we have X multiplied by Y, Z. That should give us the same thing as if we multiply X and Y first. So here we have X multiplied by Y. And we keep the Z to the right. And then we multiply those. So we have X y multiplied by z and we should have those two things as equal so this is just telling us that multiplication of elements of our group is associative and we also have this diagram here so let's understand this what this is saying is that if we have an element x then um, if we get its inverse and x and we multiply those together that should give us the same thing as the identity element here. Because when we composed along here, that means we get X and then we delete it. And then we produce the identity elements. And so this just sends X to the identity elements. And this should also equal what we get when we go this way around, which gives us X times the inverse of X. So this is just saying that when you multiply an element by its inverse, you get the identity. And then finally, we have this diagram commuting. So what's this saying? It's saying if we start with X and then we get the identity element and X and we multiply these together. This is giving us the same thing as if we go this way around and here we get X and E and we multiply those. So we should get X. So we should get X multiplied by E and we want these two paths to give us the same result as if we just do the identity. So basically we actually want this diagram to commute. And so we want E times X to equal X times E to equal X, which is the result of doing the identity on X. So there we have it. This is our other perspective on a group. A group is just this data here shown in black with the property that these three diagrams here shown in black all commute. Um, and then what's a group homomorphism? Well, a group homomorphism, let's say we have two groups. So we have um, this group G here, which has this identity element EG and this multiplication MG. And we also have this group H, 
Well, what's a group homomorphism from G to H? Well, it's just going to be a function F from G to H, which has the feature that these two got diagrams commute. And basically, this is just saying that the thing preserves identity elements and composition. Let's see this more precisely. This is saying that F sends the identity element of G to the identity element of H. And this one says if we have X and Y, then if we get FX and FY and we multiply them together, let's write it like this. Well, that should give the same result as if we first multiply X and Y and then we do F on them. Like that. So that's it. That's a definition of what a group is and group homomorphisms. And then, of course, we can form this category of groups and we have like identity arrows and composition just working like in sets. You know, we've just got these kind of functions that are sending elements um, from one group to elements of another one and we can compose them like we compose with functions and so on. Okay, so okay, so you might be wondering why I'm bothering to define groups using these kind of diagrams. I mean, I've already given you an equivalent definition of what groups are as these kind of special categories with one object and only automorphisms. Um, so why bother drawing all these diagrams? Well, the reason is because this kind of perspective of what a group is, is really ripe for generalization, okay? So, you know, I started out by saying, well, we're working in the category set, okay? But you might have noticed that most of the things that I've talked about didn't really require special properties of the category set. And so what we can do is we can replace set with some kind of more general category C. Okay, so let's now just suppose that C is any category that has all finite products. Okay, so C has a terminal object. And if we have a couple of objects, we can form their categorical product. So let's suppose that G has that kind of structure. Well, then we can define the notion of a so-called group object or a group internal to this category C. And the definition is pretty much identical to the one I've gone through. So an internal group of this category C just consists of this kind of data here. So an object G and these three arrows like this, which is such that these three black diagrams here commute. And so we have all of these kind of groups which are internal to our category C. And we also have this notion of a group homomorphism uh, from one internal group G to another internal group H. And that's just gonna be an arrow F from G to H. And it's gonna be such that these two diagrams here in black commute. So this is this idea of internal groups. And um, we're gonna have a category, which we can call group subscript C. It's gonna have objects as the groups internal to C and arrows as these kind of homomorphisms between these kind of internal groups. So this is actually really nice because it means that a lot of the things that we do in group theory can be thought of in a more general kind of way. Um, and so this gives us this notion of an internal group of this category C, which is also called a group object um, of this category C. And like these kind of things appear a lot in mathematics. So in particular, there's this category called top, which I haven't talked about much yet uh, in this series, but it's the category that has objects as topological spaces 
and arrows as continuous maps. So um, a group in this category top is the same thing as what people call a topological group. Uh, there's another category um, which some people call man. It's this category of manifolds. And a group object in man is the same thing as a Lie group. Now, actually, instead of this category of manifolds, I prefer this category of smooth spaces, which is sort of similar. Um, I like this uh, synthetic differential geometry, and that's kind of giving you a similar perspective. But anyway, I just wanted to point out that um, we can think about groups which are internal to other categories. And these are nice because it often means that you can use the same sort of reasoning as you use in ordinary group theory, but you can think of that as kind of happening in this different or more general sort of arena. And it can lead to interesting sorts of extra structures that come along for the ride. But saying all that, we're probably not going to focus very much on this idea of internal groups today. So I'm just mostly going to be thinking about, if you like, the category of groups that are internal to sets, which is basically just the same thing, which is basically just the same thing as the category of groups. So um, I'm just interested now in ordinary groups that just have sets of elements. And, you know, this multiplication is just this sort of binary operation. The identity is just a element of G and the homomorphisms are just functions. I'm going to go back to that basic sort of setting. Okay then, so let's go back to thinking about the ordinary category of groups. Uh, so if you like, you could say it's the category of groups internal to sets, but we're just talking about ordinary groups that have ordinary sets of elements and ordinary multiplication as a sort of binary operation and so on. And recall that we've already encountered this group here. And we could say it's the group of permutations of this two element set here. So we have this two element set with elements zero and one, and it has these two permutations, the identity permutation E and this other permutation S, which swaps around zero and one. Actually, instead of calling it S, let's rename it. Let's call it W. So I want to use S for something else. So uh, it's called W, W E equals E W equals W and W of W equals E. Because if we switch twice, then that's the same thing as doing nothing at all. Okay, so this is a very familiar group to people, and it's often written as S2, and it's called the symmetric group on the set of two elements. So in general, if we have a set of n elements, which we could just write as n, then Sn is going to be the symmetric group on n elements, and it's just going to have these kind of members as these kind of permutations of this set of n elements and we can compose those permutations to get other permutations. So in this case it's very simple because we just have these two elements and so the only permutations we can do are just the identity and this w operation that swaps around the two members of this two element set. Now it's interesting that Basically, the same group can appear in many different places. And so here's um, another group. Uh, it has two elements, which are called one and negative one. And the kind of composition operation just corresponds to multiplying these two numbers together. So uh, one times one is one. Uh, one times minus one is minus one times one is minus one and minus one times minus one is one. Um, so notice that actually this group here looks the same as this group here. And indeed, these two groups are isomorphic. 
So these are both objects in the category of groups. And there's this, there are these kind of isomorphisms between them, which basically just um, kind of relabel things like this. So here's yet another manifestation of the same group. If we consider the thing that has two elements, zero and one, and now let's have our multiplication as addition mod two. Okay, so um, zero plus zero mod two is zero. Zero plus one mod two is the same thing as one plus zero mod two, which is one. And one plus one mod two is zero. And hopefully you can see again that if we sort of put these things in correspondence like this, that these groups are again isomorphic. So this, this kind of group here um, would usually be written as something like Z mod 2Z. And we'll probably get to that later uh, where that idea comes from. But for now, just think of this as a name and this is the definition. So the definition is that x multiplied by y is just x added to y modulo 2, which means that we just take the remainder of this number when we divide it by 2. So all of these groups are pretty much the same. Um, they're isomorphic and, you know, in a sense, we don't really care about the differences. Um, I'm going to give them different names, though. I'll call this one S2. I've already given this one a name. Uh, let's call this one in the middle. Let's call this group in the middle C, because why not? So, so these are some groups. Here's another really important group. Uh, this is the group of integers, and it's written as Z. So this is a group. It has an element for every integer, and our operation is just addition, okay? So if we like, we can think of this again as a sort of category with one object. And we have all these arrows and these are automorphisms. So for example, this arrow two uh, has this inverse here, which is minus two. And then composition just corresponds to sort of adding the numbers allocated to these arrows. So if we compose uh, this arrow two with this arrow minus three, then the result is going to be 2 plus minus 3, which is going to be minus 1. So this is a very um, sort of natural example of a group that's very important. And we're going to see more about it later. So what I want to do next is to give you another perspective on the category of groups. And it basically involves showing a really important adjunction. So there's some adjoint functors at work. So to say it briefly, we have this category of groups and we have this category set. And there is this forgetful functor U from groups to sets. And all it does is it takes a group and then it forgets about the kind of group operation, the multiplication. And it just gives you the the set of elements of that group. So it's a pretty simple idea. And it, of course, just maps these homomorphisms to the sort of corresponding functions, just showing you how the homomorphisms work. Um, now, it turns out, and this is important, that this functor u, this forgetful functor, has a left adjoint that we sometimes call the free functor. So we have these kind of adjoint functors like this. And this turns out to be really important because basically it gives us another way to understand what this category of groups is. Um, because if we compose these two functors, so if we do 
u after f, well, let's give that a name. Let's call that t. Now, it turns out that basically t is going to give us a monad on the category set. And it turns out if we get the eilenberg more category or the category of algebras of this monad, that's equivalent to the category of groups. OK, so basically the the kind of goal here is to get this monad, because with this monad, we can get a different perspective on what groups are. Um, now, the way all this works is explained in my video on monads. Um, basically, the idea of how if you have adjoint functors, you can get a monad from that. And the idea of how, you know, what this uh, Eilenberg more category is, you know, how could we get that if we have a monad? Um, but this is kind of why we're interested in in um, this adjunction. I probably won't get too into the details of monads uh, in this video, but definitely this adjunction here is worth looking at um, because like, well, it's just really interesting, basically. Like it's very, it's a very sort of natural operation to do to get a group and forget about its group operations and get the underlying set. And it turns out that this kind of left adjoint basically makes what we could call free groups. So we can sort of get a set and in some sense, use that set of elements to freely kind of make a group. And um, this turns out to be really sort of essential for the basic structure of this category of groups here. So in order to understand about this, we're going to need a couple of things. One of them is this group Z of integers. And the other idea we're going to need is the notion of coproduct. So it turns out that the category of groups has all coproducts. And so I'll just briefly show you how you can get the coproduct of a couple of groups. So let's say we have a couple of groups. I'll do an example because it's, it's a nice way to explain. So let's suppose we have the group of integers and also this group C. So remember, this group C here just has elements one and minus one, and the group operation is just multiplication. Um, so if we have a couple of groups, like let's say these ones, or could be anything else, the way that we form this kind of co-product here, um, which is also called the free product of these groups, is that, well, we have to um, cook up the elements of this new group here. And the elements are just the sort of words or strings or sequences that we can make by attaching together elements which come either from this group on the left here, in this case Z, or this group on the right here, which is in this case C. So our elements are going to be things like this things that we can write um, just by forming sort of general sequences, which are made um, from either elements from Z or elements from C. However, what we want to do is reduce these sequences as much as possible, either by applying the kind of group operation of Z or the group operation of C. So for example, we've got two red ones here. So these are two elements that came from C. I'm writing the elements from C in red and the elements from Z in green. So since these two are next to each other, we can multiply them together and one times one is one. Uh, similarly, we have this two and this five here, and these are two green elements. They're two elements from Z and they're next to each other. So we can apply our group operation and we'll get a seven here. And here, similarly, we do minus one times minus one, which is going to give us a one. And so this is our sort of reduced form. And so the elements of um, this kind of free product group or 
like the co-product um, of these two groups are just these kind of words that we can make formed by elements of uh, Z or elements of C, but reduced as much as possible. Uh, so if we reduce this, it gets to here. Um, but notice that these two elements here will not be the same, right? Because they're, well, they're just not the same. And then how, and so this is what the elements of Z times C look like. How do we multiply two elements together? Well, we just concatenate them and then reduce. So that will become a 10 like that. And uh, that's how our kind of group operation on Z times C works. So I'll just bracket these off. And so I'm showing here some of the elements of Z times C. I'm showing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different elements of this group here. Obviously, there's an infinite set of elements. Okay, so I'm telling you that this is a coproduct of Z and C. And if that's true, there ought to be some kind of injection arrows, okay? And there is. So um, here's a copy of Z, and here's a copy of C. And you can hopefully see that, you know, there's like a first injection, I1, that works like this. And there's a second injection, I2 that works like this. And these are going to be group um, homomorphisms. But also we need to have this sort of universal property, right? Um, that's what makes this thing into a coproduct. So um, here we have another group. It's isomorphic to C, but um, we'll just give it another name. It's We could call it Z. Um, mod 2z or z mod 2 and um, there's going to be uh, and there's going to be a group homomorphism from z to this thing that just sends these uh, integers to their value mod 2 and so on Obviously, this continues forever. Um, and then let's call this, and so let's call this F. And then there's another group homomorphism here that's going to send this neutral element, this neutral element, and this non-neutral to non-neutral. That's G. And so when we have a group homomorphism F from the thing on the left that we made our coproduct with and we have a group homomorphism g from the thing on the right that we made our coproduct with well then we ought to be able to form this sort of co-pairing of these two morphisms that we could write as f comma g and it should basically kind of make this diagram commute right so if we inject this stuff into here and then we apply this map it should give us f and similarly, if we do this second injection and then this co-pairing, it should give us G. And this should basically be our sort of, and basically this F comma G should have this sort of universal property. So how do we get this F comma G, this map from this co-product into this target group here? Well, we could ask, what does it do to a particular element in this coproduct? For example, this one. And so how does this co-pairing work? Well, if we look at one of the elements of this coproduct, it's this sort of word, and it consists of things that came from C and things that came from Z. Now, if the thing uh, came from C, then, well, we have G defined on C, so we do G on such a thing, so we do G of one. Now, this seven, came from Z, 
And we have f defined on that, so we do f of 7. And we do g of 1. And we do f of 3. So basically we're getting this word, and it consists of a load of elements, some of which came from our left-hand group, and some of them came from our right-hand group. And we just apply the map which has that particular group as the domain. And that gives us this. And then we can just sort of evaluate this and multiply these elements together in Z mod 2Z. So in particular, uh, G of 1 is 0. F of 7 is going to be 1 because 7 is odd. G of 1 is 0. F of 3 is is one and now we're just doing the group operation on all of these things so we're sort of um adding these together mod two and that's going to be giving us zero so we have that this co-pairing here is going to send this element here to zero and this is basically how this stuff works okay then <clears throat> okay then so now we have co-products under our belt we can understand about this functor here and more interestingly we can understand about its left adjoint so this is going to shed a lot of light on things but just to set this up there's one other little idea that we need and this has to do with the fact that group homomorphisms preserve inverses so we have a very fast proof of this so, of course, we know in a group, every element has an inverse, which has this feature that if we multiply on the left or the right by the inverse, we get the identity. Um, but we need to show that the identity, but we need to show, but we want to show that the inverse of an element is unique. And we can do that very quickly like this. So suppose we have a group B. And we have these elements, little b and little b dash. And we know that b times b dash is the identity. And so it kind of looks like b dash is sort of working like the inverse of b. And indeed, that is the case. Um, and we can prove it just by taking this equation here and multiplying on the left by the inverse of b. Because... Uh, in that case, these two things are going to cancel out. So we're just going to have a B dash on the left. And on the right, we're going to have B inverse times E, which is B inverse. So we've got that B dash equals B inverse. So basically, that means that whenever we have this kind of equation, it means that B dash is the inverse of B. Now, uh, the other little argument that we want is that if we have a group homomorphism phi from a group A to a group B, then that's going to send the inverse of an element A to the inverse of where it maps the original element A. So another way to say this is that the image of the inverse is the inverse of the image. OK, uh, it's pretty easy to see this, like just consider this multiplication of these two elements here. Well, we know that that's going to be. Phi of a to the minus one times a. And then we can just evaluate this inside the bracket. That's the identity of a. And we know that phi is going to send the identity of A to the identity of B. So we know that these two things multiply to give this. And then by the previous property, this stuff implies, you know, that this thing here is really the same thing as the inverse of phi of A. So that's that. And with those things under our belt, we can start to understand um, about how we can get this lovely left adjoint here, which is going to allow us to form free groups. So it's going to be very useful for us. So the key idea, the key kind of thing that we have 
is this kind of isomorphism here, this natural isomorphism. It's natural in G. And so what's going on here? Basically, what we're doing here is we're showing that this functor U is representable. So if you have a look at my video on representable functors, you can see more about this. Um, I'll try and keep this video relatively self-contained so you won't have to go there. But basically, the idea is that we have this sort of hom functor. So let's write that as um, group of Z comma blank. And it turns out that that is naturally isomorphic to our functor U. These are both functors from the category of groups to the category set. Okay, let, let me be a bit more down to earth about this. What we're really saying is that if we have any group G, then if we do U on G, remember U is this forgetful functor, so U is going to send this group G to its set of elements. So U of G is just the set of elements in this group G. And that's what we have on the left. And what we have on the right is the set of homomorphisms from this group Z to this group G. So what we really want to do is to show that the elements of G are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the maps from Z to G. And this is indeed the case. And you can kind of see how this works. I mean, firstly, if we have a map F from Z to G, well, we can get an element from that, right? Because what this is really saying is that um, for every integer, um, for example, for the integer one, we're going to get a element of G, which will be F of one. So basically what's going on here is we've got, um, let's use a different color. We've got minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, and so on. And each of these are getting mapped to an element of G. So in particular, this number one here is going to get mapped to some element X. And so we can just get that element X. And that's how we go from something in here to something in here. So to say it more simply, um, the way this isomorphism works this way is that we'll be sending homomorphism F from Z to G to F of one. That's pretty simple. It's more interesting the other way around because if this is like an isomorphism, then what we want to do is if we have an element X in um, our group G, we ought to get a corresponding map from our integers to G, a group homomorphism. And um, we can actually do that, okay? So what we do is we start making this map and um, what we're really doing is we're gonna send number one to X. And so we're gonna definitely send this integer one to this X, which is gonna be an element of this group G. Now, the interesting thing is that we can make a map that does that and once we say, well, we're going to send number one to X, the whole of the way that the rest of this map works on all of the other integers gets fixed. And actually, this is really the same kind of thing as happens in the Yonida lemma. But let's just look at it directly. OK, so what's going on here is that if we know that F of one equals X, so let's write that down f of one equals x. Well, what about f of one plus one? Well, because f is a group homomorphism, we know that f of one plus one ought to be the multiplication 
of f of 1 and f of 1, which would be x times x, which is determined, right? Because this is just using x and the multiplication that's, that's in g. Um, similarly, what happens to minus 1? Well, f of minus 1 is going to be the inverse of f of 1, which is going to be the inverse of x, and so on. So you can see that once we stipulate that f has to send 1 to x, the whole of the rest of the way that f works is going to get fixed. And in this way, there's this sort of correspondence between the elements of g and these group homomorphisms. So, so it's pretty interesting what's going on here. Um, basically, that if we pick an element x um, of g, then we get this kind of corresponding map from the integers to g. And let's give that map a name. Let's call it f superscript x. Now, um, basically what we've got going on here then is that there's this sort of isomorphism um, psi going, um, that's, that's living here. So to say it more precisely, um, what we have is this category of groups and this category of sets. U is a forgetful functor, sending groups to their sets of elements. And we have this hom functor here, sending a group G to the set of arrows from Z to G in group. And then what we're saying is that these two functors are naturally isomorphic. So we have a natural isomorphism psi from this hom functor here to u. Another way to say this is that u is a representable functor. But anyway, um, we have this psi and sort of illustrated how the inverse of psi works on the chief component. You know, it sends this x here to this map f of x, which is defined as I've already described. Now, um, basically, we can roll with this and see some interesting things going on. So I don't want to get too much into detail. You can kind of gloss over this if you're not familiar with representable functors, but it is kind of interesting to see what this means. So one of the lovely results about representable functors is that when we have a situation like this, where we have a natural isomorphism from a hom functor to another functor that goes into set, well, it turns out that this corresponds to the fact that the kind of element um, that we get from this natural isomorphism here, in particular, um, when we take the zth component of psi and operate it on the identity element of Z, because, you know, the identity element of Z is going to belong to the set of arrows from Z to Z. Well, when we take this element in here and apply this function to it, um, then we get this element here, um, and this is going to be an element of this group Z. And it turns out that this element is 1, and it turns out by this sort of well-known result about representable functors that um, what we have here is actually an initial object of this category of elements of U. Okay then, so I've been getting a bit distracted by all this uh, beautiful mathematics. Let's get back to the task at hand, which is to find the left adjoint of this forgetful functor U. So with the discussions about the group of integers, the important thing is that we have this natural isomorphism here between this hom functor here and our forgetful functor. And we'll use that later. But let's return to the task at hand, which is determining the left adjoint, which we shall call F. And that's going to be a left adjoint to our functor U. And so what we seek is a functor F from set to group, 
which is going to be the left eye joint to you. And that means that we have this natural isomorphism here. So for a set S, we're going to have the, if we do the uh, functor F, that we could call the free functor, if we do it on a set S, then the homomorphisms from F of S to G should be naturally isomorphic to the set of functions from S to the underlying set of elements of G. So we hope that we can cook up an F such that we have this kind of natural isomorphism. So let's have a go. Okay, so let's return to our original problem then. So we wanted to find a left adjoint F to this functor U. So we want to have this sort of a natural isomorphism here. Well, let's just plug in S here, uh, which is a set, uh, to be a singleton set. Um, so if we do that, then what we've got on the right is the set of functions from this single element set to UG. Well, that's clearly just going to be isomorphic to UG itself. And then on the left-hand side, we're going to have the set of morphisms from F of star to G. And, you know, if we make F of star equal Z, then we know this works, right? We, we've just derived this. We've just derived that the, the, the functions from, um, sorry, the, the group homomorphisms from Z to G are in correspondence with the elements underlying the group G. So that works. So let's have a guess more generally what F of S is going to be. So more generally, F of S, how about if we take the coproduct of Z with itself once for every element of S? Okay, we know that our category of groups has coproducts. And so let's try this. Well then, this is going to work actually, because if we look, what we want is to consider the set of arrows from this thing to G in our category of groups. But what's an arrow from this to this in our category of groups? It's just going to consist of um, an arrow from Z to G for every element of S, because that's how coproducts work. So this is going to be isomorphic to the thing where we have um, a function. So in other words, an arrow from this object to this object in our category of groups is going to correspond to an arrow from Z to G for every element of S. Why does this work? Well, consider the case where S is two. Well, then what we're going to have is an arrow from Z plus Z to G. That's just going to correspond to a couple of arrows from Z to G. Because if we have an F and a G like this, they're just going to correspond to this kind of arrow F comma G, which is this co-pairing. So that's how it works. Um, and more generally for a set S, it kind of scales up like this. So we have that these kind of arrows are in one-to-one -one correspondence with these. And if we carry on, and what else do we know? Well, we know that this, um, well, and what else do we know? Well, we know that this set of arrows from Z to G is isomorphic to the set of underlying elements of G. So we can write that this is going to be isomorphic to 
the set of functions from s to u of g. And look, um, this is what we're after, actually. Okay, um, to be a bit more precise, if we grab this bit and we put it over here and we grab this bit and we put it over here, then these two things are naturally isomorphic. And so if we can define a functor that's going to send a set S to this group here, uh, which we can, um, then it makes sense to call this f of s. And we should call this the free group generated by the set s. So what is this thing really? Well, we can kind of understand it already because we know what z is. It's just a group of integers. And we know what coproducts look like in z. But let's be a bit more explicit about what this free group is, because we can describe it a bit more explicitly. So we should have that this kind of thing works. And that means that this is probably how we should define f of s. In other words, if we can think of this as a functor from um, set to group operating on a set s, which we can, uh, then really this should be our definition for the sort of left adjoint of our forgetful functor u. So in other words, um, we have this free functor which goes from sets to groups, which is the left adjoint of our forgetful functor, and this is how it should be defined. But let's look at this a bit more explicitly. So how does this thing work? Well, it's going to be a functor which goes from set to group. Well, let's say we have an object of set. So for example, we might have this set of two elements, A and B. Well, we just send that to the set of all words that we can make using A and B and other symbols, which we'll call inverse A and inverse B. So we can write things like this. And then we want to be reducing all of these words down um, by, you know, timesing um, an element by its inverse when they're adjacent to each other in the word. So this would get reduced down to, um, well, these two are going to cancel out and these two are going to cancel out. Uh, so we're going to end up with this, I think. Is that right? Those go and those go. So we've got an A and a B and a B and an A, yep. Yeah. Um, so we, we get all of these kind of reduced words and that's basically, these are gonna be the sort of elements uh, of this free group. And then to multiply two elements together, we just stick together the words corresponding to those elements. And then again, we do this kind of reduction. Um, so that's how this thing works. And then, um, you know, if we have like a function, um, so say we have a function sending this to uh, x, y, uh, maybe like this. Well, if we have such function h, then we're just going to operate it on something like this. Then we're just going to get a sort of lifting of H with F that's going to operate on a word like this. And it's just going to, we're just going to end up with H of A, H of B, H of B, H of A, and so on. And we'll reduce them. Um, so it's sort of self-explanatory how this functor F is going to work on arrows. And so this is like the nature of this free functor. And, um, you know, because we really understand how uh, this kind of natural isomorphism works, we can work out all the details behind this adjunction, um, you know, the units and co-units and so on. You can look at my video on adjoint functors on how to do that. And then we can go into the details of the sort of um, monads, if we want, 
So we can think about this monad T and we can get its unit and co-unit and the eilenberg more category of it and so on. And you can see in my video on monads how we can do that. And it's interesting to do that because once we have this monad, we can really think of the category of groups as the category of algebras of that monad. So it gives you a, a different perspective on what groups are. And I mean, basically, the way that this sort of correspondence works is that, you know, if you have um, a function from the elements of S to the um, elements underlying the group G, you know, maybe you're going to send S1 to uh, G1 and S2 to G2 and so on. Well, that's going to give you a corresponding group homomorphism um, from this sort of free group to G. And the way that's going to work is that, you know, if you have an element in this free group, so it might be something like um, S1, S1 invert. So it might be, so it might be something like S1, S1, S2, S1 inverse or whatever. Um, well, that's going to be an element in this free group. And, you know, there's going to be a sort of, if this is our map, let's call our map M, there's going to be a sort of corresponding map M dash from this free group here to G. And the way that M dash is going to work on this element here is it's going to send it to M of S1, M of S1, M of S2, M of S1 to the minus one. But you see that this is really all determined by how M works on these basic elements, right? So it's just going to be, in this case, G1, G1, G2, G1 inverse. And so once we've uh, picked a map like this, we get a map like this. And it turns out it works the other way around as well. Um, because really, when you pick a map M dash from this free group into G, um, really all you have to do is say how that map's working on the kind of elements of this free group that just correspond to these kind of words that just have one symbol in them, you know, be it S1 or S2 or whatever. And once you said how it works on those, which kind of corresponds to defining a, an M over here on the right, well, once you've done that, the way that the map's going to work on the rest of the stuff is determined just by this property of group homomorphisms, right? That the image of the composition is the composition of the images. So we know the nature of this natural isomorphism here, and we can get all the other gubbins that we want from this. And it's a it's a very interesting kind of a junction that I would say is kind of at the heart of group theory in some sense. Okay. Um, okay, so the thing with groups is that groups are giving symmetries of things. And the way that you can think about how this works is sort of formalized by this idea of group actions. Now, basically the idea here is just that we take a group G and we, you know, if we think of that as a category with one object, we can just think about functors from that group G to some category C. And now this group is a sort of category with one object and a load of endomorphisms. And what's going to happen is that this object, this dot here, is going to become an object X, or it's going to get sent to an object X by the functor. And then each of these endomorphisms is going to become a sort of endomorphism of X, actually an automorphism of X, and we're going to be able to compose them. And so we're sort of taking these 
elements of the group or these um, sort of endomorphisms of dot and we're turning them into kind of actions or th you know endomorphisms of x that are probably going to do something like if if that if c is some category like set or a category of vector spaces you know that has some really meaningful arrows then we can basically get this idea of being able to sort of iterate those arrows and and sort of combine these operations that are corresponding to our group operations and this is the idea of group actions now um let's um just think about what's happening when we're functoring into sets because that's a nice uh, simple example now um i've sort of introduced i sort of introduced groups as categories i sort of said well we can think of groups as single object categories and i still like that viewpoint but you know some people prefer to think of a group as just being some kind of an abstract thing um which you know it's just like a set of elements with some multiplication operation and um, satisfying some axioms and so on and we can think of it that way too um and so to distinguish when i want to let's say i have a group g sometimes if i want to think of g as a single object category i'll write that category as b underlined g i'm just following notation from emily reel's book and i think it helps to clarify so when when i write b of g i just mean the group g thought of as a category you know a category of one object an arrow for each element of g arrow composition corresponds to multiplication within the group g so then i can write things like a functor from b of g to let's say a category c and what this is going to do then is it's going to send this object dot because really this category b of g is just going to be some kind of a loopy thing like this and dot's going to get sent to some object x and this is really going to end up defining a sort of group action on x so um a nice thing about this is that if you think of things this way you can see you can see the sense in which groups give you symmetries of things so um let's have a look at an example so we've already talked about this group that i'm calling c here it's basically the same thing as the symmetric group on two elements but let's think of it like this so let's say that c has these two elements i'll think of it numerically because i like numbers uh so you know it's got two elements let's call them one and minus one and our group operation is just multiplication um, and so this is our group we can draw it as a category like this and then we can consider a functor from b of c to set so what's that mean well we've got to have to send this dot to some set so let's uh, pick the set which has these five elements here so uh, this is f of dot and now we have these two endomorphisms of dot and we have to send each of those to endo functions of this set so let's send the identity to the identity because we have to because we're defining a functor and now we have to send this other endomorphism of dots which is called minus one we have to send it to some function from this set here to itself and that function has to have the property that if we apply that function twice it gives the identity that's because you know um this uh, minus one arrow as an endomorphism of dot has that feature and the functoriality kind of forces us to define something like this so we could for example define f to the minus one like this so it swaps around elements one and two and it keeps element three the same so we can draw a nice little picture of what's happening here um like this so this is a sort of picture and if you look back at um what we were thinking about when we were looking at the category of dynamical systems this should look kind of familiar to you um but anyway you can see that basically what this f to the minus one is doing is it's just swapping around elements one and two and it's keeping element three the same and 
in a sense, you could say that this is describing some kind of symmetry. OK, um, so. For example, um, let's say you have like a, a spinny bow tie and. Um, basically, this bow tie like it. It's uh, it has a sort of um, pivot here and it looks like this. And you're sort of insisting that your bow tie has to be horizontal um, because you want to look smart, but you don't really care um, whether it spins around. So you could spin it around like this by um, by 180 degrees and it would look the same and you wouldn't care. So basically you have these two configurations of your bow tie and either one is sort of suitable. So in a sense, you have a sort of symmetry or a sort of um, rigid motion that you can put your bow tie through. Or if you like, you could think of it as a sort of um, permutation of the four corners of um, the four external. Well, OK, let's say the, the five vertices of this bow tie, um, which you deem acceptable. And so we could sort of picture the scenario um, a bit like this. And we could say, well, here's our bow tie. It has these five points. And then I'm allowed to do this kind of operation here where I just rotate things around like this, which basically corresponds to turning the bow tie upside down and keeping point three fixed. And let's call this rotation R, or we could call it minus one. And then if I perform R twice, it's going to return the bow tie to its original position. So you can see that in a way, this kind of group action um, happening on this set of five elements here is representing a kind of symmetry of a structure. Uh, this is a bit of a contrived example because I'm restricting very much the kind of operations I'm doing. But, you know, if you have a look, for example, at a triangle, um, this is a, a case that we'll consider later, but, you know, um, if you have a look at a triangle that has three vertices, you can think of the different sort of symmetries of that triangle. So imagine you have like um, a triangle, a triangular piece of paper, equilateral triangle, and you can sort of rotate it or pick it up and flip it over and whatever. So you have these um, six different operations that you can do, and they're sort of like ways that you can transform this triangle around. Well, those operations are going to combine to give a group. And the idea is that you can think about um, the sort of group action of that uh, acting on an actual triangle, or you could have it acting on something else that has a triangular symmetry, like a regular hexagon, for example. And um, that'll give you some ways that you can transform around things. So this is the sort of idea of group actions. OK, then. So let's take a look at a big result from group theory, which is called Cayley's theorem. And um, in a sense, it sort of tells us that every group is describing the symmetries of something. Uh, but I'll be more precise. Um, so if we have a group G, then a, a subgroup of G is going to be a subset H of G, which itself is a group using the same identity elements and the multiplication on G. If we restrict it to H, that makes H a group. Um, so we know that there are some kinds of groups uh, which are pretty kind of natural, which are called symmetric groups. So if we have a set, then we can make a group based on that set, uh, which is the symmetric group. And that just has elements as permutations of that set, as in bijections from that set to itself. And then composing those bijections is the group multiplication. And so there are lots of um, symmetric groups. 
Um, there's a symmetric group for every set. And if you get a big symmetric group, it'll have lots of subgroups. And so people were wondering, uh, is it true that you can get any group as a subgroup of a symmetric group? And it turns out that you can. And this is Cayley's theorem. Now, um, the reason I mention this is because there's a very neat sort of way to look at Cayley's theorem. In a sense, it's just a sort of um, consequence of the Yonida lemma or sort of Yonida adjacent kind of understanding. So in particular, um, a result that I'm not going to um, prove today, but I've proved it in other videos, I think on um, on the Yonida lemma or on the um, representable functors video, maybe even in the all concepts. Um, it's this idea that we have this Yonida embedding and that it's fully faithful. So what's going on here, we pick any category C and then we always have this so-called Yonida embedding, which is a functor Y from C to this category of functors from C op to set. And what it does, it sends an object little c to this hom functor here. Um, so this is the Yonida embedding. And it turns out that this is a fully faithful functor. Okay, so it acts like um, it's like a bijection uh, on HOM sets. Um, so in particular, um, so in particular, what this means is that the set of arrows from C to D is going to be isomorphic to the natural transformations between these HOM functors here, which is a pretty interesting idea. Um, and it turns out that this is really, in a sense, a kind of generalization of Cayley's theorem, or to say it another way, we can prove Cayley's theorem pretty easily using this. Um, so let's have a look at this. So let's um, think about a group G. Now, um, I want to use a bit of different notation here to sort of disambiguate things. Um, I sort of started off this video by saying, well, you can really think of a group as a category of one object um, and only automorphisms, which is true. But, you know, we can also think of a group more abstractly, you know, that it's this set of elements with multiplication and blah, blah, blah. So if we take G to denote a sort of abstract group in that sense, then if we want to regard G as a single object category, well, let's call that B of G. This is just some notation that people use. So for example, um, I've talked about this group before, you know, with elements one and minus one and multiplication. Well, this would be the group sort of abstractly, and this is the group as a category, okay? So it's gonna have uh, a single object and these two arrows and composition looks like this. Um, and this is already pretty interesting because um, you'll note that we can take this category B of C and then we can form the opposite of it. Um, in this case, it's, um, it's going to look similar to the original um, category because this is a abelian group. But in general, if you sort of take this, you're essentially taking the sort of opposite of your group. So it's as if um, you're making a new group where you've got a new kind of multiplication, let's call it star, and x star y is y times x within the original group. So you're sort of um, flipping things around in some sense. Anyway, so that's one idea I wanted to discuss. Another thing, another thing then, um, is about this symmetric group. So um, I've talked about symmetric groups a bit already. Um, if we have a set, like just let's think of a finite set just to keep things simple. So if we have this set of elements from one to N, 
Um, well, we can think about the symmetric group on those elements. And we can think of that as a category with one object. And so what we want really is like a single object and each of these kind of endomorphisms of this object is going to stand for a permutation. And then composing these arrows corresponds to composing permutations. That's what this category B of SN should look like because SN means the symmetric group on N elements. So how are we going to cook up this? Well, it's pretty easy. We just look at the category set and then we'll take this set with N elements. That's going to be an object of this category set. And we'll look at all of the automorphisms of this object N in set. And uh, yeah, that's, that's going to look just like B of SN. We could define it to be such. So what we really want to do to prove Cayley's theorem is to show that if we have any group, uh, so for any G, there exists a set N, uh, not necessarily finite, um, which is such that B of G is going to be a subcategory of B of SN. So that's what we want to do. And um, so let's do it. So an idea that we're going to use here is the idea of a so-called G set. G set is just going to be a functor from B of G to set. And we'll, we'll consider a functor F. Okay, so this will be an example F of a G set. And it's an interesting idea. Basically, we kind of make a set which has a kind of um, endo function on it. And in a sense, that kind of endo function works like the kind of group operation. And we get such an endo function for every element of our group. Um, so let's have a look at a practical example. Okay, so if we consider, again, this group C, then we can say, well, what would be a C set? And it's precisely the same thing as a functor from B of C to set. So let's consider such a functor F. So um, here's our um, category BC. It's got one object, which is called dot, and it has an identity arrow that we'll ignore. And the only other arrow is this one called minus one. So to form a C set, we just have to send this object dot to a set. So I'll send it to this set of elements from one to five. And also we have to send this arrow minus one to a function, um, which um, goes from F of dot to F of dot. And of course we have to have a functor here. Okay. So we have to have the feature that like um, F of minus one composed with minus one, um, is f of minus one after f of minus one and so on. Okay. Um, and in particular, this condition here um, is kind of interesting because we know that um, f of minus one after f of minus one is just id. So this is just going to be uh, f of the identity. Um, so in other words, what we're saying here is that F of minus one better be a bijection of this uh, set with five elements. And it, it better have the feature that if we perform it twice, um, it acts like the identity. And so what this means is that, you know, say if we're sending one to two with this function here, well, we better send two to one. And in fact, if we sort of draw where all the elements get mapped by uh, f to the minus one, we're going to get a picture like this, right? Where all our elements are either sent to themselves by f of minus one, or, you know, they're sort of swapped around with some mate. And so um, 
this is what a sort of C set looks like. Um, and there we go. So now using this idea of the C sets or, you know, if we've got a group G, G sets and using the kind of Yo Needle Lemma, we can prove Cayley's theorem. Okay. So let's do this. It's very straightforward now. So um, let's remember what we want to prove. Uh, so we have a group G and we want to show that G is a subgroup of the symmetric group on some set. Okay, that's what Cayley's theorem claims. Um, an alternative way to say it is that um, we're going to have that um, B of G is going to be a subcategory of B of S X for some set X, where S X is the symmetric group um, that comes from, you know, the permutations on the elements of X. So um, how are we going to do it? Well, here's how it works. Uh, we start with B of G. Now this is just a category with one object. And then we can do the Yonida embedding. So this is going to send B of G to this category of functors. Now um, we can really think about this category of functors in lots of ways. Um, what we could say is that uh, what we have here is really um, sort of the category corresponding to the opposite of group G. And so let's say we call this uh, thing here, uh, I don't know, let's call it G prime or I'll call it B of G prime. It's the category corresponding to G prime where G prime is the opposite of group G in the sense that, you know, multiplication works the other way around. Well then, uh, this is the category of G prime sets. Um, that's just what it is. But in a sense for us, it doesn't really matter. But in a sense for us, it doesn't really matter about the structure of this category, not, not for this proof. It's very interesting, but we don't need to know about it for this proof. All we need to know uh, is that this Yonida embedding is fully faithful. Why is that important? Well, uh, think about it like this. What we have here is some group as a single object category. And then this Yonida embedding is going to fully faithfully embed this into this category of pre-sheaves here. So inside this category of pre-sheaves, there's going to be this object here. And, you know, there's going to potentially be a load of other stuff um, that, you know, maybe we're not so interested in. The point is that the Yonida embedding is going to send this into this. Um, why is this important? Well, it's because what we can also do is we can do this forgetful functor here. And this functor U here is just going to forget about the sort of um, group action structure on the objects in this uh in this category here. So what I mean by this is we can sort of ask, well, what does this category look like? And I mean, roughly speaking, it's going to have objects that let's say G was C. So it's going to have objects that look like these kind of uh, G sets here. Um, and then there's going to be sort of, um, morphisms between these G sets that are going to correspond to particular functions, um, which are going to be in some sense compatible with the kind of group actions that are on this stuff. Um, but then when we apply this forgetful functor, all that happens is that we sort of forget about this um, sort of group action structure, but we've still got the elements. And so we end up getting stuff like this. And this is just going to turn into a into a function. Okay, so uh, if this was our original H, then this is going to be U of H. 
So you can see that this uh, functor u here is going to be a faithful functor, right? It's not going to send two of these kind of um, arrows in this category here to the same thing. And because of that, basically what's happening to this um, original group here, B of G, well, it's getting sent to this kind of um, part of this category of uh, pre-sheaves here, and then we're doing U on it. And so it's going to end up getting sent to some um, subcategory of set. Okay, so in the end, um, this is going to end up being some um, object of set, and these arrows here are going to end up being automorphisms. And then the point is that what we end up with here is just like an object of set with some automorphisms. And so this is going to be a subcategory of the object we get by taking this same thing, this uh, purple dot here, and these automorphisms, and also adding in all the other automorphisms that this has. And what this is going to end up with giving us is B of S N, where this object here is N. And this is the basic idea of Cayley's theorem. But let's, um, let's have a look at this in more detail, because it's interesting what's going on here. So we can, for example, consider C here. So... Um, there's minus one, and there's one. And then under this Yonida embedding, this is going to get sent to this sort of hom functor here. And um, as a sort of C op set, it's going to look like this. Um, we're going to have these sort of two elements here, and then this like minus one action is going to swap them around. So this is just going to be an object in this sort of category of um, C op sets. And there's going to be various other ones like um, this one, for example, and many more. And each of these is just going to be an object in this category here. And so this particular one is going to have uh, some um, endo maps, some endomorphisms. Uh, one of them is going to be ID. Another one is going to be this one that swaps these two things round. Uh, we could call that W. And so what we really have here is this sort of object which has W and an identity. And then when we do this forgetful functor, we're essentially taking this stuff here and then we're forgetting about the kind of group action. So we have this kind of stuff. But, you know, basically what we end up with is something that's going to hold this object here um, and it's going to have this endomorphism W and it's going to have um, it's going to have ID. Now, um, you know, it's also going to have other arrows as well, right? Because this is in set, like this functor U, this is, um, this is faithful, but it's, it's not full, right? The, the, um, for example, there's a function that does this, right? Um, so let's say this one is called K. K is going to be in here too. Um, and in general, there could be other automorphisms here. In fact, um, you know, if we look at all the automorphisms, that's going to fill out this to end up looking like uh, B of Sn, if this object here is called N. Uh, but the point is that um, we can see by sort of composing these that what we're doing is we're injecting B of G um, to be a sort of... Um, subcategory of um, this kind of um, category of automorphisms of N, which we can get by sort of, um, you know, looking at it within set. 
Okay, so it turns out there's a really interesting way to look at groups using some category theory, and it's called forming a translation groupoid. So here's the idea. Suppose we have a group G. Now, as I've said before, we can think of G as a single object category, something that looks like this. So each of these endomorphisms, automorphisms is an element of our group. The identity arrow is the identity element of our group. And if we form this kind of thing from a group G, sometimes we'll call it B of G. The B is kind of redundant notation in a sense. We're just trying to indicate that we're really treating this group G as a category. Now, what we can do is think about a functor from this group or this single object category into set. And let's call this functor X. And so what's gonna happen is that this single object is going to get sent to a set and each of these sort of elements of our group is going to get sent to a permutation of that set, a bijection of that set to itself, a bijection from that set to itself. So this is what in group theory they call a left G set. So um, you could say, well, here's our set of elements and we have this left action um, on this set X by the elements of G. Now, this is just a different way of saying that um, each of these kind of arrows in this uh, single object category here is going to get sent by this functor X to a function X of, let's say, G1, which goes from this set to itself. And if we perform this function on an element x, well, we could call the result x of g1 of little x, or we could introduce this shorthand and write it as g1 dot x. And we'd say that this is the left action of g1 on x. And this is, of course, going to give us another element in our set. So we have this kind of notation that we use. Now, we have this functor X from this category into set. And when we have a functor from a category into set and we want to sort of visualize it or think of it as a category, it's often a good idea to just look at the category of elements of that functor. And if we do that in this case, the resultant category is this thing called the translation groupoid of X. So I'll say what it is explicitly. It's a really kind of simple idea. So um, basically this would be the category of elements. So if we want to think about this um, in a category theory way, we'd say that we have this category set and we can form these two functors into set. This one picks the set with a single element star. And here's another functor into set, this is X and this comes from BG. So we have these two functors that go into set. And so if we form this comma category here, we can write it like this and it's our category of elements. But we don't need to understand that because we'll just look at this thing explicitly. It has objects which correspond to elements of this set X. Okay, I should write this is X of dot. Sometimes I might not write the dot just because it's um, kind of saves work. So um, this basically has objects which correspond to elements of our G set and the morphisms just correspond to these kind of operations that can change one element into another by applying these left actions of G. So what I mean to say is that an arrow from this object here, X, to this object here, Y, would correspond to an element G of our group, which has the property that we have this triangle commuting. Or a much easier way to say it is that this uh, category, uh, which we'll write as a star slice X, and we'll call it the translation groupoid of X, well, it has objects that just correspond to elements of the set x of dot 
and an arrow from one such object to another so let's say an object so let's say an arrow from little x to little y just corresponds to some element g of our group with the property that if we do the left action of g on x we get y so it's really a very simple kind of idea so let's have a look at this really simple example this is the group which has elements as integers mod 2 and the kind of group operation is just addition mod 2 so you know like um 1 plus 0 mod 2 or the remainder when we add 1 to 0 um, is 1 so when we multiply 1 and 0 we get 1 uh, similarly 1 plus 1 mod 2 is 0 so we have this and so on and so if we think about this as a category we can form the sort of category corresponding to this group let's write it like this well, it's just going to have a single object, of course, and it's going to have this identity arrow that corresponds to zero, and it's going to have this other arrow that corresponds to one. And we have the feature that if we compose this arrow with itself, we get zero because one plus one equals zero mod two. Now, if we consider a G set X, a left G set X from this into set, well, that means that we're going to have a set of elements. So um, so that means that this dot here is going to get sent to some set. So um, let's send it to this set with uh, three elements, one, two, and three. And then each of these arrows here is going to have to get sent to some function from this set to itself. So this zero here is a identity arrow so because we're having a functor we better send that to the identity so we don't really need to think about that but um but this other arrow here is going to have to get sent by this functor to an endo function of x of dot and it's going to have to have the feature that if we apply the endo function twice, we get the identity. And so, for example, we could have it like this. It could swap around one and three and leave two alone. So that might be what we have X as one doing. And so now what we've drawn in uh, red and black on the right here is really a description of this functor X, uh, which goes from this category here into set. And if we form the category of elements of this, um, that's something that we could write as a star slice x. Well, it's a very simple, well, it's a very simple thing is this category of elements. It's going to have objects corresponding to elements of this set. So three objects, one, two, and three. And there's going to be an arrow from one object to another when we can perform our sort of group action or when we can apply this kind of function to send one element to another. So um, in particular, if we apply this group action corresponding to one, if we apply it to two, it just leaves two alone. But if we apply it to one, it changes it to three. And if we apply it to three, it changes it to one. And so this purple arrow, this corresponds to uh, this, so let's, let's draw this in purple. Also, let's say the red action, we'll draw it in red, and that's just gonna be the identity. So it's gonna look like that. And so this whole thing here is this category of elements here in this case. So I really, so I really like this idea of a translation groupoid it relates a lot to vibrations and categories of elements and representable functors and all sorts of things. If you look at those, it kind of gives more insight. Uh, I like it as well because it converts uh, group theory into category theory in some sense. I mean, the two are 
very closely um, intersecting anyway. But um, so another thing we can do, um, a kind of simple idea is that, well, if we have the ability to change any functor into set into one of these element categories, well, what happens if we look at the hom functor? Okay, so you remember we're thinking of our group G as this sort of single object category, B of G. It has a single object dot. So we can form the hom functor, hom of dot comma blank. And indeed, that's going to be a functor from this category into set. And so what happens if we look at the translation groupoid of that? Um, by the way, why is this thing called a translation groupoid? I should just say in general, it's called a translation groupoid because it's a groupoid, right? It has the feature that each of its arrows is an isomorphism. So yes, um, so yes, the question is then, what's the translation groupoid of this look like? In other words, what's the category of elements of this hom functor? And it turns out to just be the same as the slice category, dot slice bg. And we can describe this explicitly. It's going to have objects that just correspond to elements of our group. And the arrows, uh, an arrow from, say, g1 to g2, is just going to correspond to an element g of our group, which has the feature that if we multiply by g on the left, it changes G1 into G2. So we have this kind of thing. And this all just follows directly from the definition of a translation groupoid. Uh, but it's, it's nice as this because it sort of gives us the ability to visualize a whole group as a category. And I mean, I, I think this is probably the simplest way to think about it. Just um, think of G as a single object category with a single object dot, and then form this kind of slice category, uh, dot slice G or dot slice BG, if you want to call it that. Um, it's also nice because this sort of relates to this idea of so-called Cayley graphs, which are ways to visualize groups. So let's have a look at an example. Um, if we take this uh, group here, this uh, group of integers with the operation being addition mod 2, um, so it's this group with element 0 and 1, which has uh, the group operation as addition mod 2. Well, it turns out that if we take this group and we take the product of this group with itself, we get a nice little group, which is called the Klein 4 group. So let me explain. Basically, the Klein 4 group, the simplest way to think of it, is it's just the group of symmetries of a rectangle. OK, so um, if you take a rectangle, you can sort of, um, you know, like a piece of paper, you can flip it horizontally, you can flip it vertically, or you can rotate it 180 degrees, or you can do nothing. So you have these four different operations, and you can just compose them by doing one after another. And so you get a group out of this. And it's called the Klein 4 group. Now, another way to think of this, um, it kind of gives me an excuse to introduce this idea of the direct product of groups. And so in general, it's a very powerful concept, is that we can form the direct product of um, a pair of groups. So if we have a group G and a group H, then we can form this group called G times H, called the direct product. It's actually the categorical product of groups G and H. And it has elements corresponding to these sorts of pairs of an element from G and an element from H. And group multiplication just works like this. So to multiply these two together, just multiply G1 by G2 and then H1 by H2 and pair them together. And of course, inverses look like this and identities are just pairs of identities. So it turns out that 
this is actually the categorical product uh, within the category of groups. And so things work out very nicely. Now, now in this case, it turns out we can get the Klein 4 group by taking our group of integers mod 2 and just timesing it by itself. So that's a kind of nice way to think of it. And the way I like to think of it really is that you can get a sort of rectangle by getting two sticks and you can flip over sticks and that looks like this kind of group. But you know, if you're doing that in two orthogonal directions, you get this Klein 4 group, this group of symmetries of a rectangle. Anyway, let's uh, relate this back to translation groupoids. So, you know, we have this Klein 4 group. We can think about um, functors from it into sets. In particular, we can think of a hom functor from it into sets. So um, we can think of this Klein 4 group here as being this sort of category which has these uh, four objects. So we've got the, we can think of this Klein 4 group here as this category which has one object and these four arrows, the identity. And these other ones, this uh, green one here, this yellow one here, the horizontal flip, and this blue one here, which is our 180 degree rotation. So we have that, and then we can think of a functor, if we like, from this category here into set. In particular, we can think about this hom functor, hom of dot, comma, blank. And then if we take the category of elements of that or the um, translation groupoid of that, they're the same thing, um, the result is going to look like this. So what's going on here? Well, now the sort of objects of this are just corresponding to the elements of our group. So we have four of them. And then the arrows are colored um, according to which element of our group they correspond with. And an arrow pointing from something is just showing what happens when we get that element and we multiply it on the left. So let's look at an example. Um, let's say we have this... Um, green elements here that corresponds to this and we want to know what happens to it when we multiply by the left by this green by this blue element here and so that's shown to us by this picture here in particular we see that the blue arrow pointing out of the green thing is pointing towards the yellow arrow so what this is saying is that so what this is saying is that there's an arrow called one one let's call this one one i'll call them by these numerical names as well just so that um i don't have to use colors all the time so we've got an arrow called one one or a blue arrow if you like which goes from the object one zero to the object zero one within this translation groupoid here. That's what this is saying. Or to put it in a more down to earth way, what we're saying is that if we take this uh, green element here or the thing that corresponds to it being the vertical flip of the square and then afterwards so remember the thing that goes on the left is the operation we do afterwards so if we start with this vertical flip then after that we do this 180 degree translation then the result of this is going to be this yellow dot here which corresponds to this horizontal flip so let's just uh, check that that's actually the case so um we can just sort of check like this so we, we're going to start by doing this operation here. So that's going to send 1 to 4 and uh, 2 to 3 and, and so on. And then after that, we'll do this operation. And you can see that. And so this operation here is going to send 
three to one and one to three and as shown here and you can see that if we compose these two functions if we compose these two bijections here the result is this bijection shown with this these orange arrows and that corresponds to this horizontal flip so the total composition of this sends two to one and so on just like as is shown here so in other words doing blue after doing green is equivalent to doing yellow in other words there'll be a blue arrow from green to yellow so that's it now this kind of structure um, is sometimes called the Cayley graph of a group now there's a couple of uh, details here that are pretty important if you really want to get into Cayley graphs one of them is that normally people don't think of Cayley graphs as categories they think of them as graphs which are sort of labeled with colors but this is a sort of equivalent way of looking at them as categories I think it's nicer because you know you really can compose these kind of uh, colored edges um, but here's a really important note normally with Cayley graphs when you draw, let's say, a blue edge from a green point to another point, that would be showing you what happens when you compose on the right with that operation. So in this case, when you have like a colored edge coming out of something, the thing it's pointing to is the result you get when you're composing on the left. That's how I've drawn this kind of thing. But... Ordinarily in Cayley graphs, the colored edge shows you what happens when you compose on the right. You do your operation on the right. There are some people who use this sort of um, composing on the... Um, there are some people that use this sort of flipped round um, convention like I'm using here, but it's rare. Usually people use the opposite convention to the one that I've used. The Cayley graph, the directed edges show you what happens when you're composing on the right, but I'm using it to show you what happens when you compose on the left. Why am I doing that? Basically because it matches up with the category theory in a much cleaner way. Like um, we don't have to look at opposite categories and all that gubbins. I would say that it's more... Um, well, it's just an easier way to show you how you can get at the notion of Cayley graph. Okay, so one can do a lot with these categories of elements of these left G sets. So, so we've already seen that we can form these sort of Cayley graph-like structures. Another thing that we can do is we can understand about orbits and stabilizers. So... Let's suppose we have a left G set. Let's cook one up. So we've got this category G, our Klein 4 group. And here's a sort of picture of how it works. So here the uh, colored edges are showing us what happens to the elements when we compose them by something of that color. Um, and let's cook up this left G set here. So what we're going to do is we're going to have the set of numbers from one to six is our elements and these are going to form this set x like this and then for each of these colors each of these operations we're going to have an endo function of these elements and you see that the sort of operations are corresponding to what happens when we get this rectangle here and we perform these different operations, either a horizontal flip, vertical flip, or a rotation. And cooking it up like this sort of lets us make sure that we're going to get a, a proper left G set because essentially we're making a configuration of points that um, has an actual kind of symmetry which corresponds to our uh, symmetry group, this Klein 4 group. Now, this is basically the category of elements of X here. 
Um, and so we can think of X as a functor from BG to set. Um, really, this is X of dots, but sometimes we'll just call it X. And it looks like this. And this is showing us what happened. So for example, if we do a yellow action on three, that would be yellow dot three, and that equals one. So if we have a thing like this, uh, of course, this is called a translation groupoid. And this kind of translation groupoid is showing us what's happening to our different elements. And now let's think about the orbits. So if you look at this translation groupoid, it's a groupoid. So it's going to have connected components that are sort of uh, pieces of the groupoid, the, the disconnected pieces. So we've got one connected component that has uh, objects two and five, and the other one has objects one, three, four, and six. And we actually call these connected components orbits. And so we have two orbits, this one, which we could call the orbit of two. It's also the orbit of five. It's the connected component that object two lives in. It's this. And the other one is the connected component holding one, three, four, and six. And these are, are the orbits. So this, for example, would be considered to be the orbit of three. And you can see this on here because if we start with three um, and we do different group operations, we can get around these four things, but we can't get to this disconnected island here. Um, a more kind of elegant way to say this is that we can take this translation groupoid here and we can form the skeleton of it. Uh, to get the skeleton of a category, we get the original category and then we just sort of identify isomorphic objects. Or if you like, you can get the skeleton as the full subcategory of your original category, where you just pick one object within every uh, class of isomorphic objects. Um, so this forms our skeleton here. And if we take a look at this skeleton, the objects correspond to these orbits. And also the kind of arrows in this skeleton here are going to correspond to the sort of stabilizers. So if we have in general, suppose we have like a G set X, and then we have a little, an element little X. Well, the stabilizer of little X is the set of all group operations that if such, that if we do that group operation, say on the left on X, we get X. So it's the set of group operations that leave the element invariant. And you can see that the stabilizer of two in X just consists of yellow. And yellow is also the uh, only arrow, the only sort of endomorphism of um, the object of this skeleton of our translation groupoid which is still connected to the sort of orbit of two. Um, so this is part of the information that uh, goes into this uh, orbit stabilizer theorem. So, I mean, I'm going to talk about it for uh, two in this particular translation groupoid, but it works in general, okay? We could pick any, uh, object of this, we could pick any translation groupoid, but you know, this um, object two is a representative of this sort of class of um, things which are kind of um, have been stuck together when we form this skeleton, or if you like, the things that are on the orbit of two, we could call this theta two, the orbit of two. Now, um, the thing is, in general, we're going to have this kind of thing that the arrows from theta two to theta two are going to be isomorphic to, um, okay, that's all notation, I should say category of elements here. So what I'm saying is, if we look at our category of elements, so I write that as star 
slice x, that's our translation groupoid. If we look at the set of arrows from two to two, that's going to be equivalent to a set of arrows from theta two to theta two in the skeleton of this. This just holds because the skeleton of a category is always equivalent to the original category. Um, but this basically just consists of the group actions which leave two invariant. So that's the stabilizer of two that we could write like this. But there's more. In particular, let's have a look now at all of the arrows that come out of two. Well, we can write it like this. If we sum up over the y that are in the orbit of two, of the arrows from two to y, we'll get something that's isomorphic. Um, and this is going to be isomorphic to G. So if we have a look again at our picture, um, notice that coming out of two, there's going to be one arrow of every color, a yellow one, a blue one, uh, a green one. There's also be a red one. I'm not drawing the red ones because they correspond to identities. So there's going to be four arrows coming out of two and they're going to correspond to the four elements of our group. And we can kind of sweep over those arrows if we look at everything on this orbit, and then we look at all the arrows from two to that thing on the orbit. So those will consist of the arrows from two to two and the arrows from two to five. So that gives us this kind of isomorphism here. The other fact that we need, and this is kind of interesting, is that the set of arrows from two to y, if y is on the orbit of two, are isomorphic to the set of arrows from two to two. Uh, and again, this holds more generally. We don't have to be talking about two here. We could be talking about anything. But um, let's have a look at why this holds. So the way that we get this, just um, pick any action B or any arrow B from two to five in our translation groupoid. In this case, the blue operation takes us from two to five. Let's just look again. You see, the blue operation takes us from two to five. And once you've picked something like that, you can get your isomorphism between the set of arrows from two to five and the set of arrows from two to two. And it's actually given by applying this kind of hom functor here. So um, maybe a slightly more pedantic way to say this is that this is the hom functor of the translation groupoid. Um, it's the hom functor two comma blank and we're taking the beef component of that but anyway um basically this is a direct description of how it works so if we have an element v of this hom set in other words v is an element of our group that if we perform it on two we get two well what this function does is it maps it to the group element B, V. And we can see that this is going to give us an arrow from two to five, because if we do the action B, V on two, that's the same as doing the action B on the action on V of two, which is B of two, which is five. So this does give us an arrow from here to here. And it's um, undone by this operation here, which is going to map W, to B inverse W. And we can do this in general once again, uh, if we replace two and five with any uh, objects of any translation groupoid, and we replace B with any arrow from uh, what was two to what was five, then similar kind of thing works. Um, so this basically gives us our orbit stabilizer theorem. So once we've got this, um, that means that, you know, we're sort of trying to get something isomorphic to G. So we're adding up over the arrows that are coming out of two, uh, but each of these things we're adding up is isomorphic to the set of arrows from two to two. And um, we know that this is isomorphic to the stabilizer of two. And so this whole thing here, this whole expression is isomorphic to the set of orbit, the set of things on the orbit of two 
Cartesian product did with the stabilizer of two. And this is our orbit stabilizer theorem. More generally, it says that um, if we have any G left G set X and we pick any little X in it, then we're going to have uh, the um, set of elements on the um, orbit of X times the stabilizer of X is isomorphic to the set of elements of G. Actually, it's usually written like this, and people would say the number of elements of G is the number of elements on the orbit of X times the number of elements in the stabilizer of X. Okay, so let's talk about quotient groups. So the idea is that if H is a subgroup of G, sometimes we can form a new group, which we write as G slash H, and we call it G modulo H. And a sort of nice example is this group of integers mod two. So the notation here is as follows. Z is the group of integers with our group operation as addition. And 2Z is the group of even integers, again, with the operation as addition. Now, the even integers form a subset of the integers. Actually, they form a subgroup of the integers. And what we're doing here is we're forming a new group. So what is this group? Well, basically, the way that we get it is we think about 2z, and that's going to be a subgroup of the integers. So the even integers form a subgroup of the integers. But what about 1 plus 2z? Well, that's going to be all the integers we can get by taking an even integer and adding 1 to it. So that's going to be the odd integers. So we've got two different kinds of integers. We've got the even ones and the odd ones. And both of these are subsets of the integers. And we can really call these things cosets. We'll introduce this more systematically later. So what's happening here? Well, we're sort of partitioning up our integers into these two different families, the even integers and the odd integers. And it turns out that if we have a pair of integers and we do our group operation on them, addition, well, we can find out what family the resultant thing ends up in just by knowing which families the things that we started with belongs to. And this is the sort of key property that we want. And a kind of subgroup with this property, roughly speaking, is called a normal subgroup. We'll get into the details later. But you might remember from school, we have these rules like adding an even integer to an even integer always gives you an even integer. Adding an even to an odd gives you an odd. Adding an odd to an odd gives you even. And so we can make a sort of table like that. So um, even plus even is even. Even plus odd is odd. Odd plus even is odd. And odd plus odd is even. And so we can make a table like this. And this might seem familiar to you because it's basically the same group that we've seen before. In fact, it looks like this again. And this might seem familiar to you. So we could also, uh, if we put this as a zero and this is a one, we could say that this is a table for mod two addition. This is the same group we keep seeing. It's actually the only group there is with two elements. So it appears a lot. And you see the way I've defined this, I picked um, 1, 2, R, uh, and then I use this formula. But what if I use something else that was equal? Uh, so maybe instead I could have used 1, 3, R here. So if I did that, 
I'd be evaluating this, but if I evaluate this, it just evaluates to one, two, one, three of R, which is one, three, two of R. But if we work out what that is, it's just the same thing as R. So in other words, this um, way this multiplication works, according to this kind of formula, in this case, is sort of invariant under replacing this left coset here with this equal left coset here. But like I say, this isn't bound to happen. This is a sort of consequence of the fact that R is a normal subgroup. So, okay, we just saw how multiplication can... Okay, so we just saw how we can define a quotient group when we have a normal subgroup. How can it go wrong? Well, let's have a look again at our group S3. And let's notice that if we just chop off the table here, we have a subgroup. And um, basically, the only operations here are the do nothing operation, the identity, and also this operation of flipping around one and two. And this gives us a subgroup of S3. And let's call this subgroup F12 for flip one, two. So, um, so here's our subgroup. And it's pretty self explanatory. If we flip one, two twice, we get the identity. If we flip one, two and do nothing, that's the same as flipping one, two, and so on. Now, um, it turns out that this is not a normal subgroup of S3. So um, let's just check that. So um, basic, so remember, this is our definition of a normal subgroup. It's that if we pick an element of our group, and so this is our definition of when H is a normal subgroup of G, and it says that if we pick an element, a little H, and any element of our group, we should have the doing and what it says is that if we pick any gamma in our group and any H in our subgroup, we should have that gamma inverse times H times gamma is a member of our subgroup. So let's test this. Let's pick one, two from our subgroup. And let's pick one, three from our group. Now we should have that this kind of expression, which corresponds with this, is a member of our subgroup. But it is not. So um, in particular, if we just work this out, we can look back at the table. So the inverse of one, three is just one, three again. These two times together is one, three, two. If we multiply these, we get two, three. And notice that that is not in F one, two. So this fails. And it turns out then that F one, two, is not normal. And also, we're going to see now that trying to define multiplication, and so, and also, what we're going to see now is that trying to define a quotient group is going to go wrong now. So, what we're going to do is we're going to try to make S3 slash F12 into a group. So, we're going to try this same kind of idea as we did before. So remember how we try and cook this up. We basically form this, which we can think of as the collection of left cosets of F12. And there's no problem in defining that collection of left cosets. The problem comes when we try to define multiplication. So remember, we wanted to define it with this sort of formula here that um, if we have a couple of left cosets, let's say, G1, F12, we want to times it by G2, F12, then we'd like to define that to be G1, G2, F12. But the problem happens because we can replace this G F12 with something else, like uh, something uh, that should be equal, like let's say we have that G3 F12 is equal, and sometimes we're not actually going to have that the formula that we ought to set this to is the same as the one that we should set it to when we replace G1 with G3. 
So let's actually see this happening. It'll be clearer. So firstly, this is our subgroup. And um, let's work out what our left cosets are. So here they are. I've just write them out if you want to pause the video and check for yourself. And um, notice here that we have that these two things give us the same left coset. So that if we times F12 by identity or times it by 12, we get the same thing. So these two left cosets are equal. And so we want to define multiplication like this. So just using the formula, we should define the multiplication of this left coset and this left coset to be this left coset. If we work it out, it ends up being this. However, since these two things are equal, if we replace this with this, we should get the same result, but we don't. And this is what goes wrong. So if we work out this expression, hopefully it should give the same answer because you know, this is equal to this, but it turns out that it doesn't, which basically means that this kind of way of defining multiplication is like a bad way of defining multiplication because it doesn't make logical sense because it, it, we can have, we can replace one input like this input here to our multiplication operation with this other input here to our multiplication operation and we can end up getting a result which isn't equal these are different left cosets right we can see that um 132 f12 is different from 13 f12 um see these two are not the same so yeah this is what can go wrong Okay then, so let's zoom in a bit on why it is precisely that having a normal subgroup allows us to be able to define this quotient group. So here again is the definition of when H is a normal subgroup of G. There are actually many different equivalent ways to define normal subgroups and some of them are simpler in some ways than this, but anyway, um, we're using this definition. So it's saying that for any element gamma of our group and for any element H of our subgroup, we've got that gamma inverse times H times gamma is in our subgroup. So let's suppose that we have a normal subgroup H of G and let's see how we can define this quotient group. So we want to define the group G modulo H and the elements of the group are just going to be these left cosets of H. And then what we want to do is use this kind of formula here to define how multiplication works in this quotient group. Okay. But like we've seen, this can go wrong. So how can it go wrong? Well, there's two things that we need to investigate. Basically, what we want is that this formula is consistent when we replace either of these two inputs with something else that's equal. So firstly, let's think about what happens when we replace this input with something else that's equal. Well, in this case, we hope that we get the same result. So let's just take a look at this. If we write down the same formula, but with a G4 instead of a G2, it looks like this. G1H times G4H equals G1, G4 times H. So if we suppose now that G2H is the same as G4H, then we hope that these two things should be the same. So we really hope that this equality holds. So we're going to suppose this, and we're going to hope that we have this formula holding. And in fact, this formula is going to hold, and we don't even need H to be a normal subgroup for this. It's just this always holds. So let's show it. So um, in particular, we're supposing this purple equation here. So we're supposing that G2H is 
G2 big H is G4 big H. So that means we have this. Now, H... Now, H is a subgroup, and so it has the identity element. And so that means that G4 times the identity element, which is just G4, is going to be a member of this left coset here. But this left coset, G4 big H, is the same as G2 big H. And what that means is that somewhere in G2 big H, so it's G2 big H is going to look like this. It's going to be like G2 little h1 and G2 little h2 and so on. And somewhere in there is going to be G4. That's what this is saying if we look at the far left and far right hand sides. And so what this means is that there's going to exist a little h such that G4 is G2 times little h. And now we're 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 away because um, let us now think about G1, G4 of big H. Now we can do this substitution here and say that's the same thing as G1, G2, little h, big H. But this is just little h times big H. And because H is a subgroup, it's going to be closed under multiplication by an element of that subgroup. So this is the same as G1, G2, H. And this is the equation that we wanted. So in summary, what we've shown is that if we want to define multiplication like this, it's stable under replacing this right-hand argument with something else that's equal, and that's good. Now, the problem can happen if we replace this left-hand argument with something else that's equal. So let's have a look at that now. So again, we have our formula. And now let's suppose that G3H is equal to G1H. Now, if we write this formula again, it's going to say G3H multiplied by G2H equals G3, G2, all times H. Now, these two inputs here, these two inputs are equal. So we hope that the outputs should be equal. So we hope that these two things should be equal. But it turns out that uh, they won't necessarily be equal. We've already seen this problem happen, right? So, But it also turns out that um, if H is a normal subgroup of G, then these two things actually will be equal, and this will be consistent. So what we're going to do now is we're going to prove this. So... The argument starts in a kind of similar way to before. We're supposing that G1 big H is equal to G3 big H. And what we want to do is to show that these two things end up equal. So we want to show that G3 G2 big H is G1 G2 big H. So let's do it. So firstly, um, we know that the identity element E belongs to this subgroup H. So we know that G3E, which is just G3, is going to belong to G3 big H. And we're assuming that G3 big H is equal to G1 big H. So we've got this. So this is kind of like before. This means there exists a little h such that G3 is G1 times little h. And so now we're going to use our assumption that h is a normal subgroup of g. And so what this means is that if we have a h, then, and so what this means is if we have a little h and a gamma that's just a member of g, then there's going to be a h star that's another member of capital H, which is equal to gamma inverse h gamma. And if we take this equation here, and we multiply on the left by gamma, it turns into this equation that little h is gamma, that little h times gamma is gamma times h star. And so now let's substitute gamma for g2. And so we've got this equation here, and now we're pretty much done. So now we can get the equation that we want.
So we start off with this uh, G3, G2, big H. And remember, we've already got that uh, we can write G3 is equal to G1 little h. So we do that substitution here. And now we can use this equation here, which we get by assuming that we have this normal subgroup. So we can substitute this in. So we so we can substitute this in, so we can replace this with this. And now we're pretty much done because um, when we do H star times capital H, that just gives us capital H. And so we've got the desired result that uh, this is equal to G1, G2, capital H. And that's what we wanted because this is what we said our multiplication should be defined with when we put inputs as uh, G1 capital H and G2 capital H. And this is how we should, and this is, and this is how we said that the multiplication should be defined when the inputs are G3 capital H and G2 capital H. Uh, so, you know, we've seen that these are the same and this all works out. So that's really the kind of um, basic idea and what I've really tried to show here is that we can define that multiplication consistently when um, when we have a normal subgroup. It turns out to work the other way around as well. So um, if we can consistently define that multiplication, then the subgroup has to be normal. So you can check all that kind of stuff. Okay, so let's talk about another really useful idea um, sort of connecting category theory with group theory a little bit. So in category theory, there's a general notion of kernels of arrows, and there's also a general notion of images of arrows, at least to some families of categories. And we can use those notions in our category of groups. And so we get the notion of the image of a group homomorphism and also the kernel of a group homomorphism. So if we have a homomorphism, say F2 here from this group A1 to this group A2, well then the image of F2 is just going to be the set of elements of A2 such that there exists an element of A1 with the property that F2 sends that element to B. So it's basically just the set of stuff in A2 that gets hit by something from A1 when we apply the map F2. That's just what the image is. The kernel is, if we have uh, an arrow, like say F2, a group homomorphism, the kernel of it is just the set of stuff in the source group or the source of, the kernel of F2 is just the set of elements of the source group that get mapped to zero by F2. So, this kernel here of, in this case, fi plus one is going to be the set of um, elements from ai such that f of a is zero, where zero, I'm writing the um, identity element as zero. So sometimes I'll write it as zero, sometimes I'll write it as e, sometimes I'll maybe even write it as one. Uh, depending on how we're thinking of, um, you know, we're thinking of our group operation as multiplication or addition, whatever. But um, I'll write it as zero today because that's more consistent with how people usually think of kernels. So, um, yeah, I should probably say this is E instead of zero. Anyway, that's the idea of kernels and images. So what's an exact sequence well, it's just where we have some sequence of group homomorphisms that form a kind of um, composable uh, chain like this. Um, and they have the property that for every i, we're going to have that the image of fi is the same thing as the kernel of fi plus one. So basically these things sort of whenever... Uh, we have an arrow going into an object and an arrow coming out. Um, we have this kind of uh, relationship holding. So at first glance, this might seem like an odd kind of thing to require, 
But um, let's have a look at some examples because it actually it, it ends up making a lot of sense. So in particular, what happens when this is an exact sequence? So what would it mean for this to be an exact sequence? It would mean that the image of F1 is the same thing as the kernel of F2. So what's this category on the left? Well, this is just the... So what? So what's this group on the left? Well, this is just a sort of uh, group that only has one element that's uh, just the identity. And so we know that group homomorphisms have to send the identity to the identity. So the image of F1 is just going to be this zero here in A, or the identity of A. But now we know that that should be the same as the kernel of F2, if this is an exact sequence. So that is to say that um, the uh, kernel of F2 is zero. In other words, the only element of A that gets sent to the identity element of B by F2 is the identity element of A. And in fact, it turns out that this is equivalent to the condition that F2 is injective or a monomorphism. Um, why is that the case? Well, if we suppose that F2 is injective, uh, that means that it has to send distinct elements to distinct elements. So um, we know that it has to send zero to zero, but it can't send anything else to zero. So the kernel would just have to only include zero. Uh, on the other hand, if we assume that the kernel is zero, then um, if we have a couple of elements, say distinct elements, G and G dash in A, well, in that case, we if we have these distinct elements, G and G dash, we know that they can't get sent to the same thing. So what I'm saying to go the other way around is if we suppose that the kernel of F2 is zero, well, let's take a couple of distinct elements, G and G dash, now we want to show that they can't get mapped to the same element by F2. So let's suppose that they did. Well, in that case, um, if we take F2 of G together with um, F2 of G dash inverse and we compose them, well, this would have to be the same as F2 of G uh, inverse. So these composed together would give zero But um, this would be the same thing as F2 of G dash inverse. And that would be to say that G of G dash inverse would have to be zero. And that would imply by composing on the right by this, that G is equal to G dash, which would be a contradiction. So yeah, these two conditions are equivalent and saying F2 is injective or a monomorphism is equivalent saying that this is an exact sequence. And it's basically the same thing as saying that A is a subgroup of B. So it's kind of cool that you can say this just by drawing a little diagram and saying, well, this is an exact sequence. Also, uh, if this is an exact sequence, what does that mean? Well, it means that the image of F3 is the same thing as the kernel of F4, um, but F4 is sending everything to zero. So um, the kernel of F4 is all of C. And we're saying that that's the same thing as the image of F3. So that means that F3 is surjective. So this means F2 is injective. This means F3 is surjective. In other words, it's a group homomorphism but thinking of how it operates on elements, it's surjective. So now this is an interesting case. What's it mean if we have this whole big thing is a exact sequence? Well, it's going to mean that this is injective and that this is surjective. But also we're going to have that the image of F2 is the same thing as the kernel of F3. So this is interesting because it's basically saying that A is a subgroup of B and that 
we can get A and that we can get A uh, by, so this is interesting because it's basically saying that A looks like a subgroup of B and we can get A as the kernel of this map F3. So there's a lot of information packed in by saying that this kind of thing is an exact sequence. So there's a couple of key examples of exact sequences which come up for us. We've seen this idea of um, the categorical product in the category of groups. This is this idea of direct products of groups and they give us exact sequences. So in particular, this is gonna be an exact sequence. So um, what we have here is the direct product of group A and group B, and this is our projection map. So it's gonna send A comma B to B. And now uh, this is clearly gonna be a surjection. And then if we have a look at the, and then if we have a look at the kernel of this map, that's gonna consist of all of the A comma zero belonging to A times B. And so then we can define this sort of corresponding injection like this. So this is gonna send A to A comma zero. And it's basically gonna define a subgroup of A times B, which looks like A. And really this sort of looks like the kernel of this second projection here. Um, here's another example uh, when we have that H is a subgroup of G. So in this case, we're going to have that this um, quotient group here is going to have elements as these uh, left cosets of H. And we're going to have this group homomorphism here that's going to send G to this uh, left coset GH. And then um, if we look at what's the kernel of this surjection here, well, it's going to send, um, it's going to uh, consist of all of the G that gets sent, well, let's call them the G dash that gets sent to H under this. So in other words, we're going to have a G dash. Um, let's call this map. Let's call this map F3. So in other words, we're going to have a G dash um, belongs to the kernel of F3. If and only if G dash of H is H. And that's going to happen if and only if G dash belongs to capital H. Okay, so another thing I wanted to do in this video is to give some kind of um, succinct definitions of other things in abstract algebra. So um, let's do a few of those. So firstly, what's an abelian group? An abelian group is just a group where we have x times y equals y times x for any pair of elements x and y. And in this case, we often um, denote the sort of group operation on x and y as x plus y, because, you know, in a sense, the group operation works like plus in the sense that it's commutative in the sense that x plus y is y plus x. Okay, so there are abelian groups and um, we can consider the full subcategory of our category of groups on the abelian groups. So that just means we take the objects, the, the abelian groups, and all of the group homomorphisms between them. And we call that category ab. And um, it's a nice category. It has a lot of structure. Um, I want to go towards defining rings. So to define rings, um, I want to talk about a certain kind of way that we can think of ab as a symmetric monoidal category. But um, it's not what you might think. So 
this category ab does have products okay um and so indeed um we can think of it as a symmetric monoidal category using its products which are called direct sums but that's not what we want to do here we want to think about a different kind of monoidal structure that ab has uh, a different way to think of ab as a symmetric monoidal category so um, in particular um, it has what we would call a closed structure so um, you might recall from um, the video on exponential objects that um, we can get exponential objects by taking a sort of right to adjoint of something to do with categorical product. Um, and it turns out that more generally, um, when we have a monoidal product, um, so we have a monoidal category. Uh, let's, so let's say C is a monoidal category. Well, then there's going to be this functor from C times C to C that does monoidal product. Or if we fix an object G, then we could have blank times G. Um, and that's just going to be a functor from C to C. Now, it could be the case that that has a right adjoint. And when that happens in our symmetric monoidal category for every G, um, well, we call the right adjoint G comma blank. And we think of this as giving us a sort of internal hom. So when we operate this on an object H over here, we get um, we get that this functor sends it to this internal hom G comma H. And in some sense, this acts like a sort of internalization of the um, arrows in our uh, monoidal category from G to H. Like the, the way this actually works, um, you know, if, if this happens, if we have a, a, a closed um, symmetric monoidal category, the way this actually happens um, depends from case to case. Um, but, you know, that the easiest way to think about what a closed symmetric monoidal category is, is to note that set is a closed symmetric monoidal category or any Cartesian closed category is a closed symmetric monoidal category where the monoidal structure is given by the categorical product. But then we just generalize that kind of a junction that, that, that lives there um, to, um, you know, something that is giving us a sort of right adjoint to this functor we get using our monoidal product operation. Um, so why am I talking about this here? Well, it's because um like the category of abelian groups has a interesting monoidal structure it has something called a tensor product so we can form something called the tensor product of two abelian groups um but i don't think it's very easy to understand um the tensor product directly at least this has been my experience i found that it's usually easier to think about this sort of backwards. So what I'm trying to say is that the category of abelian groups has this kind of structure that I've been writing here. So we could put um, ab here. So it turns out that ab is a closed symmetric monoidal category with respect to this certain monoidal product, which we'll call tensor product or circle times. And it turns out that in this case, it's easier to define this functor here, this one that gives us our internal homs, than it is to define this circle times. So what we can do is we can define this kind of internal hom making functor, and then we can just say that we get our monoidal product um, as the sort of left adjoint of that. So let's do this. So how do we cook up internal homs? Well, let's say we have abelian groups G and H. Um, then this internal hom from G to H is going to be an abelian group. And the way it works is just um, if we have two elements of this, so, so that this is going to be a set uh, with a group operation, um, the set is going to be the set of 
homomorphisms uh, from G to H. And then um, the group operation is just sort of pointwise addition. So if we have elements K1 and K2 in this internal HOM, and we want to do their group operation on them, so we could say we want to compute K1 plus K2, well, it just has the feature that it's a group homomorphism from G to H, so it's an element of this, and it's defined on a general element X of G such that this formula holds. So this map operates on X to yield K1 of X plus K2 of X. And that's bracketed off like that, of course. <coughs> so um, this is basically how this works. Um, and actually this extends to a functor. So if we pick any G and hold it fixed, then um, we have this functor, um, this sort of internal HOM making functor like this. So it's going to send H1 to G comma H1. And uh, if we have a homomorphism phi, it lifts to um, a homomorphism like this, that's going to send an element P in this internal HOM here to phi after P. So it's a normal kind of HOM style thing. And now um, we can just say that um, there's all for for every G, we're going to have that um, blank monoidal product G is going to be the left adjoint of um, of G comma blank. And actually, um, I think what we have here is is like a multivariable adjunction. So if you really want to go into the details of this, you can have a look at um, Emily Reel's book, Category Theory in Context, and I'd uh, recommend taking a look at um, equation 2.3.8, as well as definition 4.3.7 in uh, Emily Reel's book, Category Theory and Context. And you'll see kind of how you can understand or you'll start to see how you can understand the tensor product in terms of um, this kind of a junction here. Um, but I mean, basically what we have is this normal sort of formula that we have when we have our joint functors. And the sort of punchline here is that um, this um, category of abelian groups with this tensor product and um, also the monoidal unit is just the group of integers, well, it's going to be a closed symmetric monoidal category. So that means it's a symmetric monoidal category. And that means that we can define monoids internal to this category here. And so now we get to the sort of punchline here, because why are we interested in this symmetric monoidal category? Um, well, the, the main reason is because we can ask what's a monoid in this symmetric monoidal category. So um, you may recall that um, you can always think of what the monoids are in a uh, symmetric monoidal category. So, you know, they're going to have like a multiplication and um, so, you know, they're going to have like a multiplication and a unit and they're going to satisfy the ordinary conditions, you know, the diagrams that um, monoids are supposed to satisfy. And so we can think about what um, a monoid is internal to this kind of symmetric monoidal category here. And such a monoid turns out to correspond exactly to a ring. Okay, so this is cool because it gives us a way to think about what rings are. Um, and so it turns out that, um, you know, the kind of rings that we like uh, usually, you know, the, um, the associative unital rings, well, they just correspond exactly to the kind of monoids um, internal to this kind of 
symmetric monoidal category here. And, you know, if we consider then, you know, this symmetric monoidal category, of course, we don't just have internal monoids, but there are sort of morphisms between those internal monoids. And if you look at that whole structure of those monoids and the morphisms between them, you get this category, which is the category of rings. So that's nice because it gives us a kind of um, a kind of backdoor to understanding what rings are. <clears throat> so, okay, if we want to be a bit more um, explicit about this, then um, let's actually see the definition of a ring properly. So we'll just talk about so-called associative and unital rings. So what they are, basically, it, such a ring means that... So what is such a ring? Well, it consists of a set R, and then we have this kind of addition operation and this zero element, so that we have an abelian group. And we also have a multiplication operation and another element called one, um, which form a monoid. And we also have these sort of distributive laws. So we have this and this, so we can sort of um, expand out brackets when we multiply by something on the left or by something on the right. And that's what a ring is. And then there's this category of rings, as I say, and um, a ring and then a morphism of rings is just going to be a function from the elements of one ring to the elements of another ring, which um, preserves the group structure, the abelian group structure and the monoid structure. So, you know, um, it, it sends uh, elements, you know, it sends zero, sends zero of one ring to zero of the other ring and one of one ring to one of the other ring. And um, the image of the addition is the addition of the images. The image of the multiplication is the multiplication of the images. That's the idea, the usual idea. And so we get this category ring. Now, um, rings are pretty important in abstract algebra. Um, and then there's sort of special rings, which are called fields. So a field uh, is a so-called commutative ring, uh, meaning that we always have A times B is B times A. And to be a field, we also have to have the property that every element A has a multiplicative inverse, which we'd write as A to the power of minus one, has the feature that if we times A, by a to the minus one, we get one out. So this is the idea of a field. And so also now we have the idea of rings, we can define ring modules. Now, um, this sounds kind of um, abstract, um, but there's a sort of shortcut to define these things. Um, and I think it's very nice. I think that it it gives a lot of um, insight into what's going on. And um, it sort of, um, yeah. So what are our modules? Basically, they're kind of like vector spaces. So I'm going to define everything properly in a minute. But just to say quickly, they're like vector spaces. But instead of being based on a field, they're based on a ring. Okay. Um, but let's define them more precisely. So suppose we have a ring R, and we want to define this category called R mod. And I'll say it's the category of left R modules, whatever that means. Um, but how do we cook it up? Well, we cook it up basically using a monad. So we want to define a particular monad T on the category set. And um, we're going to define it as follows. So if we have a set A, then T of A is going to be the set of finitely supported functions from A to our ring. So here, the, the support of a function chi is going to be the set of inputs which are sent to non-zero values, because, you know, zero is an element in our ring R. Um, we're assuming here that R is a associative 
unital ring, um, which, you know, a lot of people just call a ring. Anyway, um, so this is what T does um, to this set A. It sends it to this set of uh, functions into our ring. What's it do to a function F? Well, it changes F to this function T of F, which basically pushes forwards these maps chi along F. So what this TF does is it's going to um, send chi to psi, where um, psi is going to be a map from uh, B to R, and its value on little b is just the sum of the elements in the pre-image of chi of those elements. Um, so that's how uh, this works. And so we know the nature of this functor T. We also need to know the unit and the multiplication for this monad. So the unit um, is pretty straightforward. It just sends an element A to this delta function here. Um, so that's just going to send A dash to 1 if it's equal to A and A dash gets sent to 0 otherwise. Uh, the multiplication, um, basically, um, we could call something like chi, I'm going to call it a distribution, okay? I, I probably shouldn't, but I like the an analogy with um, probability theory. And so we can say that what we have here are distributions over distributions. So um, phi here um, is going to take this uh, map from distributions to values in the ring, and it's going to send that to a distribution. And how do we get this uh, resulting distribution zeta? Well, its value on A is just obtained by summing over the distributions over A of um, the sort of value allocated to that distribution by phi times the value that that distribution allocates to that A. And so basically we're sort of flattening or averaging uh, over this distribution of distributions. And that's what this mu does. So that's basically all we need, okay? Because what we have with this data is a monad uh, on set. And so we can consider the category of algebras of that monad, also known as the eilenberg moore category of that monad. And that turns out to be our category of R modules. And basically what an R module looks like is it's sort of like a vector space, but it's built on this ring R. Uh, as opposed to a field, okay? But we've already seen that, um, you know, fields are kind of special kinds of rings. Uh, they're commutative rings where there are multiplicative inverses and um, for every non-zero element. Um, and uh, so the, um, the category of... Um, Vector spaces is just going to be K mod, where K is a field, is one of these special rings. So we get our we get the notion of vector spaces over a field, um, you know, from this as well. Also, fun fact is that if we take our ring to be the integers, um, then Z mod turns out to be equivalent to our category of abelian groups. Um, so we sort of come full circle in a sense. So it's, it's pretty nice that we can get all these definitions. And I think that when one looks at these things in terms of um, monads, particularly, like it's like a really um, fast track to all these different ideas. And it also kind of makes one see that um, these categories of algebras of monads explain like they, they allow you to get at a lot of ideas in a very similar fashion. So it's sort of worth studying them directly in some sense, because you can kind of understand lots of notions in abstract algebra sort of simultaneously. Because, you know, we get this category of um, this Eilenberg moore category, and then there's this sort of free forgetful adjunction between that and set and um, 
you know, lots of categories of um, abstract structures like groups, abelian groups, vector spaces, R modules, and so on, uh, sort of emerge as these kind of structures. Um, so it's it's interesting.